Joseph Hoffman was the greatest pianist I ever heard. I always thought that when I was six, and I still think that now. Yeah, I first heard Hoffman play when I was about seven years old. And um, I went every year. That was he, he, for me, was the, the great pianist that I idolized. And, and I, still, I still remember lots of details. I remember more details of Hoffman's concerts probably than any other, than any other pianist I heard. But um, the first concert I heard, he did the Mozart A minor rondo. Well, I, I must have been seven. I remember this very elegant, very beautiful performance. And um, he also played the G major nocturne of Chopin, which is one of the hardest nocturnes of Chopin, is all the parallel thirds. He played it in an enormously fast speed, much too fast, of course. Uh, and uh, I was with um, somebody who knew him, a pianist called Louis Greenwald, who was a symbolist accompanist and knew all these people and took me every year. And I said, why is he playing it at that tempo? And Louis said, he can't play it any faster. <laughs> Hoffman used to do these things like that. He used to play things as a kind of dare. And uh, it was very funny, the playing, the playing erratic was, uh, would be the wrong word for it, that there were performances at which he gave great attention to what he was doing and played with enormous elegance and real perfection. And there were others where he was a little more absent-minded and was sort of fooling around. The really great recordings of 1924, 1925, the Brunswick recordings, that's the way I remember Hoffman playing and, and it, it was that extraordinary ele elegance. I mean, those 1924-25 recordings are absolutely amazing that um, there's almost nothing like them in the history of recording. The last time I heard Hoffman play was one of his last concerts. And, I was studying with Moitz Rosenthal and with his wife, Hedwig Kanner, and she was sick that day and he wanted to go, of course, and so uh, I went to the concert. Actually, I took Moitz Rosenthal, he must have been way in his 80s at the time, and I was in a box with Rosenthal on one side of me and Joseph Levine on the other side of me, which I remember very well. And I remember Hoffman came out on the stage with the program, which he put on the music rack to see, to see what he was playing on that occasion. I don't remember his ever doing that before. This was in his last years and so on. He still played at very, very remarkable performances, very elegant. Although I do remember he played Opus 31, number three. And uh, when after the scherzo, Rosenthal turned to Levine and said, too fast. And then uh, after the minuet, Levine turned to Rosenthal and said, too slow. And then, then, of course, both of them went backstage to tell him how wonderful it was. So I presume that's what they were telling him. So they were not speaking to him in a language that I understood at the time. <laughs> I'm not sure whether they whispered Polish, if it's possible. I think, uh, the the um, concert I think I remember best is one at which he played the, the Reminiscence de Don Juan, the great fantasy on themes from Don Giovanni. And um, that was a performance that was almost impeccable. And by that time, I certainly knew that music very well. It was 1940. And um, so I really could judge by that time uh, what kind of performance he was giving. And I remember saying to Harold Schoenberg that that was one of the greatest performances I ever heard. And he said, I know about that performance, is that after he walked off the stage, Hoffman said to somebody, that's the first time I've played that piece the way I wanted to. So I was really privileged on that occasion. But I mean, he, could, he, did, he had an extraordinary repertoire. He had a huge repertoire all of which I gather he learned before he was 20. And when he was in his 20s, he gave, I think, 20 or 25 concerts in one season without repeating a single piece. But then after that, when Rachmaninoff had dedicated the third piano concerto to him, he never played, never learned it. And when they asked him why, he said too many notes. I mean, this, this actually, it, it, happened, it gets harder and harder for musicians to memorize things as they get older. And Hoffman had this extraordinary memory when he was young and he had this huge repertoire. And he played um, huge amounts of it. Uh, people said that in his programs it was rather limited, but that's not true. Did things like the Schumann F sharp minor sonata and the Beethoven and the Hammerklavier. He played all that in public still. And um, when he was, he was in the good mood for it, it was absolutely extraordinary. And he had this extraordinary technique. I mean, that was, that by, by technique, I, I don't mean just that he hit the right notes or that he played very fast, which he could do. What it was, was the most extraordinary range of tone color uh, in the history of the piano. I mean, I know of no other pianist who had that extraordinary control of, of tone color. So that, for example, there are recordings like the, 
Brahms' arrangement of the Gavat from Gluck's Alceste, in which there are three levels of sound and absolutely impeccable. You would think he was playing with three hands or that there were three different pianists playing. And he did amazing things in sound effects. Uh, f f there is one recording this second Hungarian Rhapsody where he begins a trill fortissimo and suddenly drops in the middle of the trill to a pianissimo without missing a beat. He did all sorts of things for tone color like that. Uh, and, uh, but they were never gratuitous, it was always very musical. Uh, the other thing that I remember is that, uh, would, would like to say is that, that he actually contradicts a great many of the myths that one has about the pianists of the 1920s. Uh, we very often hear that they all played rhythmically very freely, um, that they never played with their hands together. Uh, there is a beautiful recording that Hoffman did, I think 1924, of the C-sharp minor waltz of Chopin, in which in the outer sections he plays with his hands absolutely together, and in the inner section, which is very lyrical, the hands are very slightly apart. I mean, that, I mean, that must be the real old tradition of rubato. Rubato, I mean, one of the meanings of rubato is to play with the hands apart like that. And it was not used all the time. It was sort of not smeared like expression over everything. And also Hoffman's playing, uh, he, he did use certain rhythmic freedoms, but the playing was almost most of the time close to metronomic. There is even, in fact, that the recording of the Second Hungarian Rhapsody of Liszt um, is in some ways out of style because the opening is marked a capriccioso, I mean, supposed to be, you know, very, very freely, and Hoffman plays it almost in absolutely strict time. It's also the noblest performance that I know. The playing was extremely aristocratic and very noble and very reserved. It's also, what you remember if you see in the films that they have of Hoffman, was exactly as I remember, he made almost no no particular gesture. He sat very simply at the keyboard and played, except for a fortissimo where he would raise his hand above his head and bring it down. That was about the only gesture of any kind that, was in, that one, one could see him. It was really, it was very extraordinary playing and that it was, it was the elegance and the variety of sound. I mean, I know of nobody who controlled the sound of the keyboard the way he did. He, he was really a great musician and that, uh, he, he never flaunted it, that it was, um, it was never dogmatic, and it was, it was very often there was kind of improvised effects. He used to amuse himself, as most of the pianists at that time did, um, like Levine and others, of bringing out inner voices, sometimes rather surprisingly, sometimes not terribly successfully for the music, but I mean, he, that the, the understanding of the structure of the piece was really extraordinary in, in all of the performances that I heard. He, he also um, occasionally could uh, fool around in public that um, uh, he did on one occasion as an encore. He threatened to play the uh, Rachmaninoff prelude in C-sharp minor, and he told Rachmaninoff that he was going to do that, and Rachmaninoff begged him not to play it. So what he did was he began it and then shifted into another piece, it's sort of like this. Was the, it certainly was a joke that to do that. I think, uh, I'm not sure if that was the concert in which he played the Chopin B minor sonata. It's possible that that was the concert. But I do know a story about that, which is that uh, after Rachmaninoff heard that performance of the B minor sonata, he said, another piece that I have to take out of my repertoire. I mean, Hoffman was enormously admired by, he was the, 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 great, the great admiration of all pianists. He was, there was almost no controversy uh, about, about his playing of his contemporaries. The only pianist I, I know who really disliked Hoffman's playing was Claudio Arau, who hated it. But I mean, he was the great, great admiration of, of Rachmaninoff, of, of uh, Horowitz, and so on. That He did have a kind of, of status as a kind of hero or god at that time. And above all, it was a kind of impeccable playing which he could which he could do when he was when he was serious and that paid and paid attention i don't think other, uh, any other pianist had quite that unanimity of admiration that he had i was lucky i did hear hoffman play the music for which he was most famous and for which he was most admired and that is something really that i value in my experience of piano playing more than more than anything else he was amazing <laughs>